myself so we can. Break a few. All right. Uh, so it looks like the only person at the top of the hour that we don't have is uh, Commissioner Kelly. Um, so technically, we can start the meeting. John, I'll leave that up to you as the, the chair. Yes, we can definitely start. OK. Uh, just before we go ahead and get started, uh, just a few quick updates. Uh, Christina before had asked um, about the replacement um, for the school board rep on PERC. Um, I think, Kate, you weren't uh, here, but uh, Shannon Kimball, who you can see on the screen, um, she will be the, the school board rep moving forward um, on PERC. And then uh, just a few more updates. Last night, uh, the mayor appointed and then the city commission approved uh, Paula Schumacher um, to join PERC. Um, so she'll be available at the next meeting. Um, and then we have in the room uh, Jean Dorsey. Um, I don't know if Kurt can, there you go. Uh, behind, uh, there we go. <laughs> um, he'll be uh, appointed next week. Um, and so both of them will, will have a full house uh, at the September meeting, as long as everyone can make it. Um, so we'll get them uh, oriented, and then uh, we can all have a good time. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, John, to go ahead and okay, start thank the meeting. Uh, Sam, since we do meet irregularly, uh, Sam Camp wrote a preamble that we thought we should read before the meeting, uh, and we'll do this uh, for meetings now and then for the near time forward. It reads as this, the Public Incentive Review Committee, PERC, serves as an advisory board to the City Commission on the use of economic development incentives to stimulate the local economy. It is the responsibility of this body to make recommendations regarding economic development incentives under the consideration of the City's economic development policy, the City's comprehensive plan, Plan 2040, and the City's strategic plan. It is in the Commission's and the public's best interest that we evaluate each project on its merits towards achieving goals set out in the above mentioned documents. PERC members are encouraged to share their concerns or support as it relates to projects' ability to meet the city goals in order to better inform the decision-making process. The public is equally encouraged to share their thoughts and questions on items up for discussion today. Uh, Shannon, thank you. Good to have you here on the board. Uh, we look forward to now when we'll have six people here and then soon we'll have eight, so that's a great idea. Uh, great to have. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the minutes from June 14th. Can we get a first motion on that? Ms. Christina Gentry, I move that we approve those minutes. Thank you very much, Christina. And a second. This is Kate no, Lorenz. I, go, go ahead, Brad. You no, got go it, ahead. Brad. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Kate Lorenz, I, I second. Thank you, Kate. We'll just go in order here alphabetically. Brad Burnside? Uh, aye. Aye. Christina Gentry? Yes. Patrick Kelly is, uh, see if he's back yet. So we'll go with uh, absent for the moment. Shannon Kimball? Yes. Thank you. Kate Lorenz? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that would be five to zero and then with one abs absent being Patrick Kelly. Going on to agenda item B1, we're gonna consider a request from Flint, Holes, Flint Hills Holding Groups for Industrial Revenue Bond IRB financing to obtain a sales tax exemption on construction materials as well as the establishment of a neighborhood revitalization area, NRA, to receive a rebate on improved property tax value to redevelop the building, building located at 1000 New Hampshire Street, Lawrence, Kansas. Okay, um, so with that, um, staff, uh, myself, I'll go ahead and give you guys a brief presentation uh, regarding the project, and then we have the applicant here in the room who's gonna give um, some additional details, and then we'll move on to the, the voting and discussion. So I'll go ahead. And wants to let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep. Yes. Um, and then just a quick update. It looks like uh, Leah Roslin just joined. Leah Roslin is the city's affordable housing director. Um, so if there are any questions at the end of the period uh, regarding affordable housing concerns from the city or any initiatives, um, she'd be the person to, to answer those. Um, so, 
the New Hampshire Lofts, um, located at 1000 New Hampshire Street. Uh, the, it, for reference, it's the, the empty lot across from Maselli's just to the west, east, apologies. Um, and they are looking for an industrial revenue bond and a neighborhood revitalization area incentive request. Um, just a brief overview of the, the presentation today. Um, we're going to be going through a couple of these items. Uh, as a project overview, um, the project is a mixed use uh, development um, with the first floor being commercial retail um, with approximately 15,000 square feet with the remaining floors being a combination of different uh, residential types, all affordable housing um, for 55 for seniors 55 years plus. Um, there will be on-site parking um, as a part of the development um, with a total of 69,000 square feet roughly in development. Um, with the, uh, the chart you'll see below is the affordable housing monthly rates uh, for the apartments. Um, for the studios, um, you'll see it's 30, 50, and 60 AMI, the area median income. Um, so those will be the caps uh, that each of those can be um, that the apartments will be, the monthly payments will be capped at for each of those levels, for each of those uh, income levels. Um, so the incentive request is a 15 year 95% uh, uh, NRA rebate with that industrial revenue bond um, as a mechanism to obtain that sales tax exemption on construction materials. Uh, the neighborhood revitalization, um, similar to the one that we met with uh, regarding uh, in June, um, it is a property tax rebate program. Um, it applies only to the incremental valuation. Um, so any taxes currently received by the, the city, county, and the school board will be uh, continued to be paid or collected throughout the perpetuity of the project. Um, and then the, again, the, the base property value is shielded. Um, as well as any of the uh, any of the increased property value percentages or the increment that's not collected um, during as part of the rebate, so that five percent um, that's in there as well. Uh, so this chart uh, kind of gives you a, a good idea of what we're looking at in terms of um, base value. The yellow is that incremental value, that five percent that's being collected. And then the green is the incremental value that's collected um, or rebated back to the developer as part of the project. Um, some of the lines are hard to see, so I added some notes down here. Um, the approximate base uh, tax payment would be 44,000 across all three taxing jurisdictions. Um, this is permanently shielded through the life of the NRA. The uh, approximate collected increment, that 5%, um, towards the beginning of the project would be roughly $3,500 split across all three taxing jurisdictions and then go up to about $5,400 by the end of the 15 years. Um, and then at the bottom uh, is that the approximate 95% rebate to the developer would be about $68,000 um, that would have normally been collected by the taxing jurisdictions all the way up to $100,000 by the end of the project. Um, just as a reminder, um, this is a list of the past projects that the city has done um, with NRAs. The two you'll see at the top, uh, Penn Street Lofts and Nine Dell Lofts, are infill affordable housing. Um, Penn Street Lofts has some first floor live work units, um, and both of those projects were done by uh, the applicant who's here today, Tony Kresnick. For the uh, industrial revenue bonds, again, it is for a sales tax exemption only. Or, uh, it is a a conduit financing mechanism for the city, um, and there's no liability um, on the part of the city for these bonds. Um, it's simply a way to get to help the developer get this uh, project exemption certificate. Um, for, for the city's part, the sales tax exemption um, would uh, be roughly about $24,000 that we wouldn't see. Um, and then the estimated IRB origination fee um, that the applicant pays on the part of the city for um, the IRB process is about $36,000, um, which is determined based on the value of the, the project. Um, so the cost benefit ratio, I know there was some concern um, as well as some, I had sent an update to you all um, fairly recently. Um, the model that we currently use um, isn't 
fairly equipped for this kind of project. Um, this is a mixed use project where the first floor will be condoed out. So in that case, there will be kind of two assessments on the property. There will be a residential piece and a commercial piece. Um, the model that we use assesses or assumes everything in that commercial level, which is assessed in the county at 25%. And then the residential is assessed at 11.5%. So the, the model can't really account for that, uh, mainly because it, it focuses on uh, development or commercial development projects. Um, so what I'll say on note of that is um, you'll see the column that says NRA commercial. Um, that will be the rebate, um, the total rebate for each taxing jurisdiction over the 15 years for the commercial piece. And then the column for the NRA that says residential and uh, AHTF, which stands for Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, is the, the rebate for the residential piece. Um, the applicant does have, uh, has received funds from the city's Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, of approximately uh, five, 500, sorry, five, I don't know how to say it. $500,000, that sorry, I couldn't, <clears throat> um, which is what accounts for that larger piece um, for the city's residential and AHTF funds. Um, I know, Shannon, you had asked about the school district. Um, the numbers that I had calculated for the, the shielded levy that the school district would still collect um, for the combined residential and commercial piece um, would be a total of about $120,000 um, with the increment over that 15 year period. Sam, can I ask a clarifying question about that? Yes. Um, is that, is that $120,000, does that represent the value of the increment um, based on eight mils? Uh, the record that we have in from the the county appraiser's office has the mill levy at uh, seven point three four seven. That's what it has listed as the shield. So, uh, is that? I know you had mentioned eight. That's yeah. So just for those who are on the committee who uh, haven't heard me raise this before, um, when it comes to the school districts finances and our funding from the state, the only fund that is that sees any increase from an increase in valuation is our capital outlay, which the board usually authorizes uh, a levy of up to eight mils um, when they do all the calculations and it's finalized. It usually falls somewhere slightly less than eight. So that sounds right to me, Sam. Um, the concern that I have express in the past and that I, I'll just express again about the numbers. When you look at the cost benefit analysis for these projects, um, that $450,000 um, the, the um, school district does not actually get any additional funding from increased valuation except in that 8 mil capital outlay fund. Um, so the entirety of the rest of our mill levy is um, basically calculated to generate a certain number of dollars, and we are we are capped at how many dollars we can generate. So that's um, I, I always feel like the 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 cost benefit analysis for these projects is uh, usually uh, misunderstood by people outside of the this group. Um, on these projects because of that. So I just I wanted to clarify that. And, and I don't know if going forward there is some way to um, express that more clearly in the, in the documentation about these projects um, yeah, or so not, but it's, it's a conversation I'd be interested in continuing to have. So thank you for that clarification. Of course. Well, and I'll say, Shannon, um, the staff, kind of a side note, staff has a meeting with the, the company that provides that model to us um, later this week, and that is a thing we can bring up. But um, getting back to the uh, proposed project, um, so some final considerations. Um, the project is in alignment with the, economic, the city's economic development policy. Um, it aligns with the downtown master plan and plan 2040. Um, it meets the city's goals of increasing adaptive reuse. Um, it is currently an empty vacant lot. 
um, as well as more affordable housing. Um, the, this project helps far exceed the city's short-term goal of 100 affordable, 100 affordable rental units by 2023 um, and further supports the new goal of 1,500 by the end of 2028, um, as well as a uh, redevelopment of a historically underutilized parcel um, Apologies for that last piece. There, it, it's an empty lot. There's no historical components to that. Um, so that's it for the, the staff report. Um, we can now go ahead and have the applicant come up and give a review of the project. Thanks, Sam. My name is Tony Kresnick with Flint Hills Holdings Group, and uh, we will go over some of the details on New Hampshire Lofts project and be happy to answer any questions as they arise. Um, as Sam mentioned, this is a, a mixed-use uh, affordable housing project located at 1100 New Hampshire Street across from Maselli's on the east side of New Hampshire. And wanted to go over, start off with the numbers. Um, as Sam mentioned, we have 30% units, 50% units, and 60% units. Uh, on average, those units uh, come in at fi uh, just under 54% of the area median income. Is a background uh, in Section 42 of the IRS's code, we're now able to charge up to 80% to still be affordable, so long that they average 60% or less. And so this project is far less than the affordable threshold of 60, coming at 53.9% affordability. 100% of these units are affordable. There are no market rate units in this project. Um, we have seven studio units. We have 36 one bedroom units. We have six two bedroom units, uh, which actually total 49 units. Uh, at the time of application, probably close to a year ago now, we only had 48 units, and we're pleased to announce that we have 49 units. The total project cost, um, and these are fairly accurate numbers based on 10-year uh, treasury today is $17,096,000, so $7.1 million project, um, which is, I believe, significantly higher than what it was at the time of our application. Um, that's due to the increased construction, uh, in, uh, construction interest and bridge loan financing. Um, we are using state and federal uh, affordable housing tax credits. Uh, we received an award of 8.9 million federal affordable housing tax credits and 8.9 million state affordable tax credits from the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. We also received a $1 million grant from the National Housing Trust Fund through the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. And as Sam mentioned, uh, between uh, local housing trust fund and ARPA funds, the city of Lawrence has dedicated and allocated $550,000 to this project. Um, the remaining project is being funded by deferred developer fee of $787,466 and a permanent loan of $2.3 million. The project um, has also signed up to achieve a HERS rating of 70 or less, uh, which makes for an incredibly energy efficient building. And from an inclusive standpoint, again, uh, we're providing 100% of these units affordable uh, at 60% of the area median income or less. And we believe we've done a good job of you know, providing something for everybody of all income uh, groups here in the affordable sector. We do have a historic resource corporation approval. Uh, these are two of our final approvals that are needed for us to get the project going and we hope to break ground on the project pending these approvals and the approval of a building permit hopefully sometime late December of this year which would slate us for a spring opening of 2025. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Tony Krisnich or for Lee Rosalind who's on the city staff advisory or affordable housing board? Hey, this is Kate Lorenz. Um, Thank you for that presentation. I have a question about, uh, can you talk through the process of um, deciding on the 55 and uh, over focus and why this will be geared towards seniors? Yeah, the other projects that we've worked on here in, in the greater Lawrence area have all been in the Warehouse Arts District. We did Polar Lofts, I believe that was 12 years ago, 
nine Dell lofts, that was nine years ago. And then a year and a half ago, we finished Penn Street lofts. All of those projects were geared towards general occupancy and multifamily. Um, within those 149 units, probably about a third of our tenants are seniors uh, or people that would qualify for 55 years of age and older. This specific location being downtown Lawrence, it has uh, easy access and walkability uh, to a lot of uh, shops, places that seniors frequent. South Park, obviously, the county is 200 yards away, the county courthouse, uh, but probably more importantly, uh, it's on the bus route. The bus system is directly in front of the property. Um, and so it, it, for those reasons, it lent itself really well for, for senior housing. And I don't believe that we've developed any senior housing, affordable senior housing uh, in the greater downtown area in the last 20 years, plus or minus. Thank you. Hi, this is Christina Gentry. I'll jump right in with the questions unless, Kate, you have some more. Um, I enjoy understanding the entomology of businesses and um, you know, just kind of wondering, you know, where you came from. Just, you know, give us a little bit of an explanation of, like, what Flint Hills Holdings LLC's origin was. Um, I'll say that because I looked up your online web page and your LLC has some really solid community engagement with like feature articles written in the Lawrence Art Center newsletter and Fort Scott raved of your uh, input and influence into the community. Um, you replied in that same article uh, from Fort Scott Tribune saying that um, by no means do you think there could be stabilized or experienced growth as they did back in the good old days, um, but county seats create very unique opportunities. So um, with that, uh, and if you could just entertain me and the folks here who are also entomology nerds, um, I'd like to know, um, one, is this a private equity group, uh, this Flint Hills Holdings LLC? And then also, um, where did you, where did the name Flint Hills Holdings LLC have its origin? Um, and, and tell us a little bit more about your company. Um, sure. Uh, I'm from, it's not terribly interesting, I'm from Wichita, Kansas, um, and, you know, grew up driving up from Wichita to Overland Park to see my grandparents when they were still alive, and we'd always drive through the Flint Hills, and, you know, you've got to come up with a name. So, being from Wichita and constantly making that drive, you know, up north on I-35, we thought that a, a good fit would be the Flint Hills Holdings Group. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Not not very fancy. Kind of probably came up with it in 30 minutes if I had to if I did look back. Right. Thank you. That's that answers in part. Um, I don't know, and I, I was kind of engaging for an understanding if you are a private um, equity group. I mean, I'm I'm a. I I I guess I guess, I mean not from the sense that I think you're you're thinking of. It's just Scott and I. Scott's sitting here in the room with me. Um, we are we are a privately held company. We're not a a, a public a, a public company. Okay. So yeah, you do have to register with the businesses and LLC. I think maybe there is a point we should say private equity group, and with that come other details. I just kind of know how you register in, in your company uh, as you are doing your LLC. Yeah, we're, we're, a, we're, a, we're a LLC registered here in right. the state of Kansas. Okay, um, kind of answers, because I, I mean, I, do, I don't know if anybody else Googles, but for Google, as much as available on the page, um, there's a couple of other things that are associated with Flint Hills properties or management. So I'm um, just kind of curious if you had any association with the Koch Industries, the K-O-C-H? Coke Industries? Coke Industries, yes. Uh, no, they're an a energy company based in Wichita, Kansas, and Houston. I have uh, no affiliation with them, nor uh, are they an investor in any tax credits to my knowledge 
Okay, thank you for that. I mean, this is just Google, right? And so not knowing you, not knowing a little bit of yeah. the context, I don't want to get to know a little bit more. Um, and then one more thing I had to ask, because um, this project looks to accept applicants 55 and older. Um, what acceptable insurance will be the, will the property accept as form of payment? Would it be Medicaid ins- or Medicare insurance accepted? Insurance? I'm sorry, for, for payment for the, um, for the property, for the units. So if you had any understanding about who would be renting, who would be the applicants and who you would be serving and the available units that you have, um, the 49 units there, do you, would, would you imagine that the majority of your residents would be able to um, be using Medicare or any insurance properties or insurance that could be used towards rent? Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's all based upon what the federal government allows and what fair housing allows. What I can say is we accept all forms of payment, including HUD vouchers um, <coughs> from the Douglas County Housing Authority. We also accept rapid rehousing vouchers. All of our property management is done third party by a p- company called Wygand Omega. They are also responsible for all of the compliance and reporting to the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. But in terms of who the tenants are and what available funds they have and where the funds come from, uh, obviously I I can't answer that at at this point. Um, From experience, I can tell you that uh, they come from all different sources, but um, we abide by all the fair housing regulations and compliance set forth by the state as well as the federal government. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I'm thinking the senior population or 55 and older population um, and how they utilize uh, monies and monetary funds and such. So I may be thinking too far ahead for you to have that information available. Um, I I, I was false. I have one more question. Um, And this is about local contractors that you may have um, be well, maybe using, and maybe you'll be, maybe not, but what local, specifically what local contractors have you been in contact to use for this construction? Uh, we have we have all third party general contractors uh, build our projects. Flannels Holdings Group, we don't do any property management ourselves, nor do we do any contracting work. Uh, we're working on this project with a local general contractor uh, who obviously uses a lot of local subcontractors. Uh, I own a local subcontracting company here in town, Kennedy Glass. Uh, I'm assuming that they'll win the bid (laughs) from the subcontracting standpoint on this project. Uh, We're also working with uh, another general contracting company in Kansas City. In fact, the the same general contractor that built uh, Penn Street Lofts at 8th and Pennsylvania. I might also mention that through the National Housing Trust Fund, we also have Section 3 requirements in reporting that's due to the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation. I had a question, Tony. If, uh, yeah. Excuse me. As far as on, do you see this, other than the 55 and up uh, category, do you see this being any different than the other, other three things you've developed downtown? Not really. No, I, th- I think it's uh, it's a lot more expensive to build yeah, uh, today. You know, was then. Uh, and you can def- and unfortunately you can you can't take out nearly as much debt because of interest rates and how high the operating expenses are. This building, actually, if you if you look at the at the renderings, this building and Penn Street Lofts are almost the I, I, almost an identical building, um, with the exception that the facade on Penn Street Lofts is geared more towards brick and mortar to complement the historic buildings that I've done across the street, whereas this building has more of a stone presence to complement the courthouse and the church directly to the south. But, um, but no, from, a, from an amenity standpoint, from you know, size of unit standpoint, uh, it's very, very similar. And again, the, the size and, and shape of this building as approved by HRC is almost identical to Penn Street Lofts. And they've all had similar affordable housing you know, structures I saw like 100 affordable units throughout these three properties. Yeah, I think I, I think it's 149 just down the street between Penn, Polar, and Nine Dell. Um, but yeah, no, same, same exact uh, program, Section 42, same reporting, same compliance, same rent restrictions. I think that the rents on 
Uh, the 54% 50, average on this might be a little bit more affordable than the others, but for the most part, very, very similar, with, with the exception um, that there are no market rate units in this project. These are, the apartments are 100% affordable. And all the parking will be on both sides, east and west of what I saw. That's, 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 that's correct. Um, to, to, that, to that point, the need for parking for seniors is a lot less uh, in demand than it is for multifamily or general occupancy, especially when compared to a market rate development. Um, and I did want to make mention of that because any given day, if you drive by Penn Street Loss at 8th and Pennsylvania and take a look at the parking lot, the parking lot's very rarely 50% occupied. So we think that we're going to have pretty good excess parking here on this project. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Grisinch? Or for Lee Roslin? I did have one more. I'm just going to hop in and, and, and bring me back to some of the things that um, the Lawrence strategy looks to include as well. Our Lawrence uh, has an equity and inclusion aspect to how we want to see um, a better community or improvements on community. So once again, I'm going to go back to my Google uh, research on your um, LLC. And I read as much as available on the web page. Um, and... Um, your public facing presence homepage. However, I did not read where there was a statement made public of your business equity, diversity, and inclusion policy. Um, I'm not expecting you to always or have that. I think that's probably maybe something we should be talking about um, within the EPIRC uh, applications. But moving forward, um, maybe you could speak about looking forward into your business practices. Um, would you consult with your market experts to create a statement which includes actionable commitments reflecting inclusivity, um, one that holds accountability of expectations of your business practice in this community? And I ask this because due to tax dollars being requested to serve a community, they should reflect the community's interest of public health and safety. So my question is, um, if you don't have it, since I did not see it on your webpage, would you think about or consider and moving forward to uh, consult with someone um, who could create an equity, diversion, and inclusion policy that would fit your business practices? I don't know. I, you know, we, I develop affordable housing. I develop probably more affordable housing than any other development firm or at least most development firms here in the Midwest. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to, to talking about, you know, our affordable housing, but I don't think that there's much more inclusion that one could serve than developing affordable housing all over the, the Midwest here. Um, if that's a requirement of the board, we could come up with some statement. You know, from a green initiative standpoint, we're developing some of, if not the greenest buildings in town um, for multifamily development. In this project, as with all my projects, we're using uh, affordable housing tax credits to provide affordable housing. Most of my projects in East Lawrence have involved the rehabilitation and salvation of historic structures. Um, and so yes, to answer your question, would I provide a statement? Um, I, I definitely could. I'd rather just have a, a dialogue like we're having today. But in terms of this project and working with city staff over the last two years, going through all of the initiatives, all of the bullet points, working with the state of Kansas, section three requirements, um, I believe that this project, you know, couldn't be more uh, suited to, to what you're asking about. Thank you, found that mute button. I appreciate your response, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? John, this is Shannon, I have a thank question. Um, and this might be more of a question for staff than it is for, uh, for Tony. Um, uh, one of the questions I think I will get in uh, responding to inquiries about this project uh, will be about the parking. And I just wanted to check in um, with city staff. I, I can see on the on the application um, how it's laid out and that there are 62 parking spaces for this. Is that the standard? Does that meet the city standards in terms of requirements for parking for a project? of this size with this many bedrooms or is, or is that a deviation somehow? So I'd have to check um, 
exactly how like where this property lands in terms of the the designated downtown area for right. Lawrence. Um, but per the, the downtown development policy, parking is not a requirement. Okay. That's, so, uh, that's correct. So it, it was not required to be part of this, but uh, even though it wasn't required, there are 62 spaces being provided. Correct. Yeah, we, we, okay. we, under, we understood that even though downtown does not have parking requirements, that it would be nice for our seniors, even though we don't believe that these 62, probably half of these 62 spots will be used. Um, the investor was interested in the in the downtown park in, in the parking spots as well, and so the 62 spots um, was were volunteered. Okay, and then in terms of um, in reading the description of the project, talking about green space, I'm I'm looking at the the overall plan that shows the parking. Am I correct to read that, that there is uh, some dedicated green space between the south end of the building and the, the church building next to it? Uh, correct, as well as on the north of the north side of the building as well. In addition to that, we also okay. have a rooftop deck for our affordable tenants. Okay, thank you for those clarifications. You're welcome. John, this is Commissioner Kelly. I got a quick question. Yes, please go. Uh, Tony, thanks for being here and thanks for bringing the project. Hey, just a quick question about the parking along that alleyway there. And you may have mentioned this earlier. I joined a little bit late, so I apologize. Uh, is there any monitoring of that parking in the back or is it, I'm going to assume it's not metered like parking in the front. And maybe you talked about this. I meant. Can you kind of go over how you're monitoring that parking along the alleyway? We're actually, yeah, we're we're actually not planning on metering the parking to the west or in the front of the building, either, Commissioner. Okay. Um, both both parking as well as the exterior of the building, north green space, south green space, rooftop deck, as well as the interior of the building. It's all being monitored um, via our security systems, uh, and we also have on-site property management. So, so if you had a vehicle that was there for a long time, you, you, you'd know about it through your security systems? Is that what you're saying? More than likely through our property management, but yeah, definitely be picked up on the security systems. Frankly, we, we only go to our security systems in the event of, a, of an incident. Okay. Um, but, you know, with as many employees as we have in the area, it would be picked up um, by the property manager, by the maintenance person before it would be brought to our attention by the monitoring systems. Great, thanks. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing no further questions. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry, Jen. Brad, did you have a question? It looks like you unmuted yourself. No, no question. Sorry. Okay. Nope, no problem. Sorry, John. That's okay. I don't see any questions from uh, the public or any online. Would you agree? Uh, no, I don't okay. see anybody for public comment. Uh, seeing no public comment at this time, uh, can I get a first motion to approve the IRB and NRA for Flint Hol Hills Holding Group LSC? Would anybody like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, this is Brad Burnside. I would move that we accept uh, the staff recommendations as to the uh, sales tax exemption through the IRB as well as the uh, NRA, NRA request of the, of the applicant. Thank you, Brad. And can I get a second motion? Ms. Commissioner Kelly, I'll second. And John, if we could have a little bit of time for or committee members maybe to explain how they're going to vote on this just so because we are an advisory committee to to the city commission and the county commission well the city commission yeah that was a great idea uh, as far as on um, comment between the group uh, i would like to i guess i'll go first uh, i do see myself approving this based on the infill development uh, the parking requirements being met uh, uh, for, as far as the past history they have, as far as meeting the affordable housing within the community, I think that there is definitely a need for that, and I think they're going to assist in that regards. Um, I think, you know, over time, you know, uh, once the 15-year NRA has gone away, you know, we'll see a considerable tax uh, uh, benefit from that. Uh, it does meet all the Energy Star requirements. Uh, 
you know, the green spaces are being met uh, through the, the patio and then the north and the south side. So uh, uh, I believe I'll be in the affirmative as far as on this one. This is Kate Lorenz. I'm happy to share thoughts. Um, I uh, I also am feeling favorably toward the project uh, for many of the reasons that John said, um, highlighting the energy efficiency um, as well as the need for afford affordable housing and um, the other incentives and partnerships that um, that Tony's been able to secure in support of the project. Thank you, Kate. This is Commissioner Kelly. We have a high need for affordable housing, especially senior affordable housing. So I was really pleased that this project included that. Um, I've heard community members concerned about other that was college housing downstairs. So it's nice to see a bit of a change here to that. Um, Tony has been a solid developer in our community, um, putting together some really nice projects. And I, one thing that I really appreciate is he brings funding from other sources and so i think it's really important that we recognize that and, and do our part to increase affordable housing through tax incentives whenever possible yes when i saw i saw 2.78 million from the kansas housing resource commission and the and of course 550 from the city so that definitely makes a difference this is shannon uh for uh, the reasons that uh, have already been shared, I also um, think that this is a project to be put forward with a favor favorable recommendation from the committee. Um, it's, it appears to meet and in some cases exceed all of the um, requirements um, that are in the city ordinance and state statute, as well as our um, um, having addressed the concerns that I, that I asked about regarding parking um, in particular. I am pleased to see the focus on affordable housing for, and also affordable housing for seniors. Um, from the perspective of this, the school district, this project um, will not have a negative impact on us. Um, it won't grow our enrollment, but I know that this is also a, um, a type of housing that our community sorely needs. So I appreciate, um, I appreciate you bringing this project forward. Thank you. This is Christina Gentry. I will. Um, I see that there have been lots of other supports um, and an understanding that uh, there is a need for more affordable housing. And I absolutely agree to the statements that other committee members have shared. Uh, for me personally, um, I I'm not very satisfied with the. Um, applicant's answer to uh, providing a future statement of equity inclusion, I feel a little bit different when it comes to safety, uh, especially public health safety and housing. Um, there needs to be something that maybe we look forward to and staff looks forward to to add that equity and inclusion as part of our application so all applicants can answer to that. I think it is important. It's not just a conversation that could be had uh, verbally. It needs to be something that's stated uh, in a future. Um, and I wasn't really... I was really under, not understanding the applicant's answer to whether or not they were a private equity group. So to me, um, that makes a difference. However, I do recognize the, the need for more affordable housing units. Uh, 49 units is, is a good bit. Uh, downtown is a good time. Uh, so I'm going to vote yes, um, but I just have that addendum um, being a, a concern for public health and safety. There needs to be more of a specific guidance that is coming from uh, developers, consultants, uh, and going forward for our community. Thank you, Christina. Uh, seeing no further discussion, we have a first motion by Brad Burnside, a second motion by Commissioner Kelly. Uh, we'll go to the voting. Uh, Brad Burnside? Aye. Aye. Christina Gentry? Aye. Commissioner Kelly? Aye. Shannon Kimball? Aye. Kate Lorenz? Aye. And I am an aye as well, and it passes six to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, so we will have a meeting next month um, for you guys just to, to give you that ahead of time. Um, and then next time we will have eight of you here. So uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.
Somebody likes.